Welcome to Thrive Church. We are so glad to have you here with us. I'm Judah, uh, pastor here at Thrive, and we welcome you here. And we are starting a brand new series uh, this week called Counterfeit God. We got our little bobblehead uh, Jesus here. Um, You know, there was a survey done in 2020, so last year, by the Barna Organization, and the studies show that Christians across our country are developing unchristian beliefs and ideas about God. That, that what we uh, think about God from Scripture is not really what so many people believe anymore. In fact, the studies show that only about 51% of people in our country, about 51% believe in God as is described in the Bible. About, uh, about 50, 51%, a little, barely more than half. Now this is down from 73% about 30 years ago. That in our country, there is this slow decline of people believing in God and their idea of who God is. Only 17%, 17 out of 100 people believe that God is active in their lives. So, so many people don't have any concept of who God is, and and many that do believe that there is some kind of God have this counterfeit God mentality. They they believe something, but it may not be what is true. There's, There's millions of people that call themselves Christians, and yet they don't believe that God is in control and that he cares about them. In your notes, if you're taking them, what you believe about God affects how you see yourself. What you believe about God affects how you see yourself. You know, and instead of Christians transforming culture around them with the biblical truth, what's happening is the opposite. That, that people who call themselves followers of Christ are actually getting transformed by the world around them. They're they're conforming to the world. Scripture says that we should not be conformed to the world, and yet that is what so many people are doing. We're accepting a counterfeit God, accepting something that is not real and genuine. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. It says, In the last days there will be very difficult Times. Has anybody had any difficult times lately? Okay, most of you have had some difficult times. It says, in the last days, there will be very difficult times. You know, as I read this, uh, it's easy to, to forget that this was written over 2,000 years ago and not like last week. Because as we read through this, like it, it's going to sound like it was written last week. Listen here. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love themselves and their money. Like, we surely don't see that these days. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing or making fun of God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. Like, we never see any of these things, do we? So they will consider nothing sacred. They will consider nothing sacred. Goes on to say, they will be unloving and unforgiving, They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends and be reckless and be puffed up with pride. And they'll love pleasure rather than loving God. Doesn't this sound like this was just written? I mean, this is like describing the world that we live in now. And and, and they're saying, this is what it's going to be like in the last days, in the final days before the return of Christ. Loving pleasure rather than loving God. Verse five says, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Underline that whole sentence there. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. It goes on to say, stay away from people like that. Stay away from people who are, you know, reckless and disobedient and prideful and and, and slander others. People who act religious, but then reject the power 
that could make them godly. You know, many people say that they believe in God, but there is this big gap of what that means. If you ask somebody if they believe in God and they say yes, like, like, that does not necessarily imply that they believe in the God of scripture, the God of the Bible. There's a big gap of, of what that actually means because so many people these days, they derive their understanding of God from things like pop culture, for example. Like, like they turn on the TV and they, they see how God is represented there, maybe from a movie, perhaps from social media, maybe from the news, maybe from, from a politician. They see how these people talk about God and demonstrate God, and then they base their view of God off of those things. There's a wide variety of what people consider God. But I believe if we want to live lives as followers of Jesus Christ, that we need to have a clear view of God and who he is. Not something fabricated. We need to understand what scripture says, what it teaches us about who God is and how he interacts with our world. In your notes, our view of God needs to come from scripture not our personal feelings and preferences. So often, our view of God comes from our feelings. Well, I don't feel like a loving God would do this. Maybe you've heard somebody use that argument before. I don't feel like God would act that way. You know what? God doesn't really care about our feelings in that way. He's not saying, oh, oh, you don't feel like I should do that. Well, let me change everything about myself then. You know, our feelings have no basis on who God really is. That's why when we learn about God, it's not based on our preferences, but it's based on scripture and what God says about who he is. This is why I challenge everyone to read scripture for at least five minutes every day at the very minimum. Reading scripture so that way you can learn who God is and how he interacts in this world in which we live. See, there is a God who is. And then on the other hand, there's the God we want. There's the God who is, and then there's the cute little God that we want. The, the, the designer God, right? It's like, like I, I want, I want the, the buffet God where I can go up to the buffet and say, oh, oh, let's see. Um, well, this whole thing about him hating sin, I don't want any of that. Well, maybe, maybe the real, real horrible sins. Like, well, we'll take a little bit of that and a whole lot of love. And, and, and we're gonna take a little bit of this and we'll take a little bit of that. And oh, we got this cute little God now. And we can put him on our dashboard and we can say that we love God because it's a God of our own creation. It's a designer God. See, but the God who is, isn't always the God I want. And that can be frustrating for people. That can infuriate some people because the God who is may not be the God who I want because my feelings and my preferences lead me one way and God is saying, go this way. So, well, if that's how the real God is, then I don't want to have anything to do with him. So instead, I will create a nice, cute little God that agrees with me, that everything I do, he's okay with, that everything I say, well, he lines up with. See, there's the God who is and the God that we want, and we need to return to a true image of God and who he is. And your notes, a distorted view of God will also lead to a distorted view of life. See, the way that you look at God also affects greatly the way that you live your life, the way that you represent yourself, the way that you work, the way that you play, the relationships that you're in. When we have a distorted view of who God is and what he approves of and disapproves of, when that view is distorted, then everything else in our life becomes distorted as well. See, many have accepted this distorted view of God. Well, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with God. I, I, you know what? We, we could just take scripture and we can just interpret it however we want. People say stuff like that. It infuriates me. 
because that's not at all what we're supposed to do when we come to Scripture. When we come to Scripture, we're supposed to look at it and say, what is God teaching us? What did God intend in this? But we're accepting a distorted view of God. And instead, what we need to do is we need to be desperate to know God and who he is. We need to be desperate to understand God in the fullness, even if our understanding of the true God disagrees with what I want him to be. That's okay. It's important that we know who God is, that we're not following a counterfeit God. You know what a lot of people want? They want a God like this. They, they, they want God to be like a genie. Like, wouldn't that be great? Like, like we watch these, these movies and stuff like that. They watch all these things. Like, like for example, did anybody, I just want to do a little, a little experience. Anybody ever see long, long, long ago uh, a, a movie about a genie starring Sinbad? Anybody see that? Okay, a couple of you people, raise your hand. It never existed, okay? It, it, it's amazing how many people even remember scenes from this movie that never existed. It's wild. I thought I saw it until I tried to look it up. Anyhow, uh, that, that's just a little rabbit trail there. But um, look it up online. It's wild. But anyhow, a genie. We love the idea of a genie, right? Aladdin, Sinbad, whoever. Like we love the idea of a genie because all we have to do is, is we rub it and then this supernatural being comes out and, and he does our bidding when he's summoned. He comes out and usually says something like, you know, does a little song and dance, a little, you know, number with a, with a choir in the background, explains all the rules. You get three wishes. You can't wish for more wishes. You know how it goes. And, and, and we like that idea Oh, what would I wish for if the genie came out? Wouldn't that be wild if I'm rubbing this and a genie actually did come out right now? That would be a great illustration. But, but there's not going to be one that comes out, but yet this is how so many people, we view God. We view God as someone who is just simply a genie, someone who is simply there to give me what I want. To, to do what I want, and then, and then if I don't get what I want, then I act like God doesn't exist. Maybe you've seen or, or known somebody that's done that. Maybe you've done that, that uh, from time to time in your own life. You want something, and if God doesn't give me what I want, then I say, well, then clearly God doesn't exist. People say, well, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna test God right now. If, if God was, was real, let him strike me with lightning. Oh, see, he didn't do it. So God clearly doesn't exist. It, it, it's silly because it's as if God's number one requirement is to obey me. Like, like as if he needs to obey me and do everything I say. And then if he doesn't obey me, then I don't believe he's real because clearly if there was a real God, he would do everything I tell him to do. Like he, he, would, he would listen to me. You know what? I was thinking about this. If there is a God who obeys me, that's a pretty puny God. Like, like if I'm the master of this God, that's a pretty wimpy, puny God. See, God doesn't owe me anything, but I owe him everything. And see, that's the thing that we need to realize. It's not that God owes me something, it's that I owe him my very life. I owe him my very breath. It says in Psalms 100, verse three, it says, acknowledge that the Lord is God and that he made us and that we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. See, we need to acknowledge that the Lord is God. We need to realize that, that there is a God and I'm not God. And, and, and sometimes we view God like being this, this big, friendly, always generous giving, you know, singing, dancing genie who comes out of this lamp whenever I want. We, I just rub my magic lamp and poof, there he is. And he appears and he gives me anything I want. And then if he doesn't do exactly as I say, then I can say he doesn't exist. See, see the Christian life isn't about getting what you want and then throwing a fit if you don't get it. See, following Christ is more about denying ourselves 
than getting all the things that we want in life. Jesus says that we need to deny ourselves, and yet so many people feel like if there's anything lacking at all in their life that somehow God has let them down. You know, where did God say that our life would be easy? Where did he say that we were gonna get every single thing we ever want? Where, where did we ever get the idea that he would answer every question with, your wish is my command. Your wish is my command. Yes, I'm, I'm here to, to obey you. God isn't our ATM. You know, an ATM is, is where you can go and, and you have money stored there and you can withdraw that which belongs to you. But God is not like that. We don't go to him and say, well, I demand you give me what belongs to me. He's not a genie bound by our wishes. We think that God should be like, like Netflix. You know, back when I was growing up, you know, we had, to, we had to watch TV as it came, you know? We'd sit down, turn on the TV, and like, only thing we could watch was whatever popped on. Like, that was it. It's like, oh, wow, this is nothing on. Well, we're just gonna watch nothing. We're gonna watch infomercials now. You know, we, we didn't have much choice. We had a few channels that we could watch, but that was about it. Now we have Netflix and Hulu and all these other things where we can watch TV on demand. I can watch what I want, when I want, how I want. And if I want to watch seven seasons of something all in a row, I can just sit here and I can watch it nonstop. I don't even have to click a button because Netflix will play the next one for me. And, and we can consume it that way. And we think that God should be similar in the sense that, God, when I don't want you, you just stay over there. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need you right now, but then when I do, I can come and I can have God on demand, and he'll do what I want him to do. Not, not intruding in my everyday life, just, just there when, when I need you, just there when I'm in trouble, just there when I need a, a raise or a bonus. But it can be frustrating when we pray about something and God doesn't do it. But yet so many that's what they do, they pray. God doesn't immediately answer their prayer and they say, well, so I don't believe in God anymore. I don't believe in him because he should do exactly what I want. I want God in my image. I want him to serve me. I want the cute little God. I want the God that does everything that I say. Maybe you prayed for restoration in a relationship and it didn't happen the way that you thought. Maybe, maybe you were struggling financially and and things didn't improve in the way that you thought. Maybe you were praying for healing and, and the healing hasn't come yet. You were praying for a promotion and not only did you not get the promotion, but you got fired for doing something. You know, you were praying to, to pass a test and, and, and you didn't study for it and you failed the test miserably. You know, in your notes, God doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. See, he's not here to serve me and, and every wish and whim that I have, but I'm here to serve him. So if God isn't a genie, if he doesn't live in a lamp such as this, who is he? Who is God? And we need to recognize that God is always loving. God is always loving. Now some people take this and, and abuse it and misuse it, but God is always loving. In 1 John chapter 4, verse nine, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God. Like many of us, we didn't even love God, and yet he still loved us. He said, this is real love. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You know, if you have kids, you know what it's like to um, maybe not always love everything your kids do, but you love them regardless. Maybe you don't love all of their behavior or what they do, but you love them anyways. Maybe, maybe there's even times that you don't do something that they want you to do, even though it's within your power to do it, but you don't do it because you see something, you see a pitfall, you, you, you're smarter than them, you're more wise than them. You know, just because you love someone doesn't mean that you're gonna do exactly what they want. And an illustration of this was when I was a kid. I remember 
one day, it was a nice sunny day, and I don't know why it sticks out of my mind so vividly, but I was in a park near my house, and I was sitting on top of this big slide, at least it seemed big to me at the time, and I was sitting on top of this slide, and I was just, you know, looking around, thinking how amazing it would be to be able to fly. I was like, this would just be so great to be able to fly, and I was up there, and I thought about jumping off the top of the slide, but I didn't want to get hurt, so, so I had this idea, I was like, if, if only I had a parachute, this would, this would help me in my, in my quest to fly. So, so I decided that I was gonna get a parachute. I didn't know where to get them, but I was sure my parents knew where you could go and buy one. So I went home and I said, I said, mom, can we go to the store? She's like, okay, why? I said, I wanna go and buy a parachute. And, and she's like, why do you want a parachute? I said, well, it's simple. You know, I, I wanna jump off things and, and, and don't worry. Don't worry, I'll be responsible about it. I thought this out. I was like, I'm gonna start by jumping off the slide. I'm not gonna go something high. I'm gonna jump off the slide and get the hang of how the parachute operates. And then after that, I'll move up to the house and I'll jump off the house. And, and we lived right next to the church, my dad pastors. And like, and then once I got the hang of that, then I'll jump off the church and it's just gonna be so much fun. Now my parents are the worst parents that ever lived. You know why? Because they said no to me. They said I couldn't have a parachute. And to this day, this, this damages me, this hurts me because they didn't allow me to have that parachute. You know, see, it would be easy in those moments to be disappointed and say, well, how can you say that you love me when you don't do what I ask you to do? How can you say that you care about me when you're depriving me of something I so desperately want? The fact of the matter is, is that they knew something that I didn't know. They were aware of certain principles of physics and nature and gravity that I was unaware of at the time. See, we need to understand that God may not do exactly what we want. Even if he can and we think that he should, he still may not do exactly what we want. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. You know, scripture says that, that when we pray, the prayers that God answers are the ones that we pray that are according to his will. This means that we know God and have a relationship with him. We know his will and then God answers our prayer. See, God is always loving. Even if I don't understand, he has my best interests at heart. In Romans 8, 35, it says this, is, can anything ever separate us from God's love? Can anything ever separate us from God's love? Now, this doesn't give us a license to just do anything that we want in life. Say, well, I can just do anything I want because nothing can separate me from God's love. No, this means that regardless of the dumb things that we do, God will still love you. He may discipline you, he may correct you, but he still loves you. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And yet sometimes that's how it feels. If I go through a little bit of difficulty, if I'm a little bit hungry, oh, God doesn't love me anymore. Does it mean that he doesn't love us when we're in danger, even threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we're killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of these things, trouble, calamity, hunger, destitute, danger, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither fears about today or worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell can separate us from the love of God. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, God loves us. So, well, I, you know, God didn't do everything I want him to do and I'm having some difficulties right now and I'm having financial problems. Oh, this must mean God doesn't love me. No, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. See, what can separate you from God's love? Oh, I, you know, may, maybe, you're not, maybe you're not going through hunger right now and persecution, but maybe you're going through some financial trouble. Does the fact that we're going through financial trouble mean that God doesn't love us? No, absolutely not. Having relationship problems. Maybe you're, you're unemployed or, or battling a sickness or disease. 
Maybe you're battling depression. Do these things mean that God no longer loves us? No, absolutely not, because there's something that we need to understand about God's love. In your notes, God doesn't prove his love when he answers our prayer. He already proved his love when he sent his son. See, God isn't proving his love by, by the fact of him answering a prayer or doing anything for me or making my life easy or comfortable. God already proved his love by sending his son, Jesus, to this earth, as it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. When did he send him? While we were still sinners. While you were a sinner, while I was a sinner, while we were rejecting God and not loving him and living in hatred towards God, God still loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us. There is never a time that God doesn't love you, but he won't always do what you want him to do. He doesn't obey you, he doesn't obey me, and he still will discipline us when we go and do things that are contrary to his word. This is why it's important for us to understand what his word is. But so many people say, but, but I don't like that. I don't agree with that. It doesn't matter if you like it or agree with it. We just have to face the fact that God is who he is, and then we need to follow him and dedicate our lives to serving him. See, God is God, and we aren't. You may encounter still problems in your life, but that doesn't mean that he loves you any less doesn't mean that he loves you less if you go through difficulties. Many of us are going through hardships and difficult times in life, and it can feel hard to put our trust in God, but in your notes, it takes faith to trust God in difficult times. It takes faith to trust him. It takes faith to realize that God has a mind that is far above ours. As it says in Isaiah 55, 8, he says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Aren't you glad, though, honestly, about that? Like, aren't you glad that God's thoughts aren't anything like our thoughts? Because, like, if God's thoughts were like our thoughts, like, it would be crazy. Like, this world would be a mess. He says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God's ways are higher. God's thoughts are higher. And we can take comfort in the fact knowing that God is wiser. We can take comfort in the fact knowing that God is stronger. And I don't have to understand everything that he does. I just believe that he is who he says he is. And I trust what he does. And I trust how he's working in my life. Some of you today have been through hell and back. You've gone through difficulties. You've endured tragedy. You've been through sickness and disease. You've endured death and job loss, and divorce, you name it. You've been through it all, but you're still here. You're still standing strong. You're still moving forward. You're still trusting in God. See, can we make that decision saying, I will trust God's heart. I will trust God's character. I will trust his nature, his goodness. I'll trust his mercy and grace. I'll trust his power. I'll trust his love. That even though I may not understand the decisions and the choices that he makes, I may not understand the situations that come at me in life, but I will still choose to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord because God's ways are always higher and God's ways are always better. Even when they're totally different from my ideas and my plans, God has the end in sight. I don't have the end in sight, but God does. And maybe you're going through something hard and you hate it. You hate what's going on in your life right now. You hate the difficulty. You hate the, the pain and the depression. You hate what's going on in life. 
and you don't understand why you're going through it, but God's ways are higher than yours. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And trust me when I say this, that God loves you. Wherever you are, whatever you've done, God loves you. There is nothing on heaven or on earth or below the earth that can separate you from the love of God. Don't doubt that. And God may not do what He want, what you want Him to do, but He promises that He'll do what you need and that He'll be there guiding you and leading you as you follow him. So Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you that you are a strong God, that you are a loving God, that you are a God unlike anything that we could come up with or create on our own. And we choose to trust in you. And we're sorry for the times that we fabricated a counterfeit version of you by our own wishes and desires. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, don't let another day go by. Scripture says anyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. If you say with your mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord, then you'll be saved. Won't you call on his name? Say, Jesus, you are my Lord. I accept you as the one true God, not a God that I fabricated on my own. So Lord, let us put our trust in you. Let us put our faith in you. Let us put our hope in you. Lord, we trust you. We want to know you more. We want to know you better. We want to know who you are and how you work in this world. We, we don't want to just follow some whims and wishes. We want to follow the one true God, the living God who loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to take away our sin, to give us eternal life in heaven with him one day. We choose to follow you. We put aside our preconceived ideas is, and we say, yes, Lord, we will follow you. We want to follow you and worship you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.